a lot of our work is um, related to salvaging, uh, excavating, understanding archaeological sites in front of highway construction. And the project that we're going to talk to each other about today, about the Bobcat burial, is one of those projects. But it's an old one. It's, it started in 1979, right at the beginning of our major highway work in the Illinois Valley, in the lower Illinois Valley. And it was the Central Illinois Expressway crossing the Illinois River. And at the bridge crossing, there was a group of burial mounds that were in, in the way of the road. And so between 1979 and the early 80s, we excavated all 14 of those burial mounds. Um, underneath them was the first cemetery. It was Middle Archaic. There were 60 or 70 Middle Archaic burials. And then in, they would have dated roughly 4,000, 5,000 BC. And then on top of them, Middle Woodland people, Hopewellian, as part of Hopewellian ritual, had built about seven more mortuary structures, which are mounds, burial mounds, um, and had done mortuary rituals, buried people, and in one case, an animal in these seven mounds. One of the mounds, mound number seven, had, uh, it was a Middle Woodland mound, Hopewellian burials, 20 or 25 people in there. Um, a lot of diagnostic artifacts that told us we were definitely in the first third of Hopewellian times, right, right around the time of Christ. And these artifacts I have set out on the table are some of the other artifacts besides the animal burial that came out of that mound. And you can see how we know their Hopewell. There were a lot of pottery vessels, and the pottery vessels have um, very elaborate decorations, and I don't know if you can see, but there are bird images on the pots. These are casts of vessels that are on display in the main museum. We were doing so much trying to stay ahead of the highway, excavating four or five large sites at a time, that we didn't go into enormous detail into each object and each um, burial context. We wrote up reports telling why they were important and went ahead. So this, this puppy identification slipped by us. Um, until a more recent study, a much more recent study, was started by Terry Martin and Angela Perry. Angela Perry was here a couple of years ago uh, on a Macmillan internship at the museum. And part of, part of her dissertation research was looking at uh, uh, prehistoric dogs. And uh, one of the specimens she requested to look at was the dog from Elizabeth Mound and uh, the, the puppy. And so we got that out. She'd read about it in the report and everything. We got it out of the box. It was labeled puppy and everything. And, uh, and uh, she started looking at it and examining it. All of a sudden she said, this isn't a dog. And I came out of my office. I said, what do you mean? And she said, it's not a dog. And we looked at it. And sure enough, the teeth and everything and said, that looks more like a cat. And uh, so that's where we uh, realized that we needed to reanalyze the whole thing. So we went through, there's over 250 individual bones with this burial. And so uh, uh, got this out. And, and first of all, verifying that it is a cat instead of a, a dog. And then if it's a cat, what kind of a cat? Is it mountain lion, bobcat, domestic cat? Uh, we knew it wasn't a domestic cat because that was something that came over with the Europeans. So uh, when we started looking at these, uh, fortunately, given the reference collections we have at the State Museum, we were able to find uh, a juvenile bobcat that is identical in age to the one uh, from uh, Elizabeth Mound. And uh, it's uh, best we can age it. It comes out uh, between uh, four and seven months of age and uh, with deciduous teeth, uh, some of the teeth still erupting, and we can see that from from the specimen here and then comparing it with the archaeological specimens, it's, it's identical age. There's, a, there's another layer to this taming and domestication issue, which is important to us as anthropologists. It may not relate to the animal so much as to how it got in the burial mound. For instance, so what if someone, some child, loved that bobcat? That doesn't put you in a Hopewellian mortuary that is very highly structured, that has stringent rules of who goes where, what they get buried with, what kind of rituals you go through. Um, you don't even see infants or very young children in these mounds. I mean, you're a human after a certain point and you go in the mounds. 
pretty much full populations. You, we've done studies of the populations. You're not leaving out anybody except very young children. So how does a bobcat get into a mound? And I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just going to say it means that there can be a scribed status. And that's an anthropological term that very seldom crosses species. We can get a scribed status to humans, but having that status transferred to an animal, some creatures can be very important because the people believe they're very important. And I think more than one person. I don't care how one person felt about this animal. It wouldn't have got it in that mound. Well, this bobcat calls out the point that uh, we have this reference collection that we use in this laboratory. Uh, we have access to a, uh, over 11,000 whole or partial animal skeletons that we can use for identif identifying animal bones from, from archaeological sites, paleontological sites. And uh, to be able to have this kind of a resource to use to compare archaeological specimens to, to verify the identifications, make sure they're correct, uh, look at little details like age differences, uh, sexual dimorphism in, in different animals, and then uh, this is an opportunity for students that are working here in the lab to, uh, uh, to continue this kind of work and, and see what goes on. It's not something that you can identify from pictures in a book or, or Google on the website. Uh, it's something you actually, if you're going to do this seriously, you have to have uh, specimens here, reference specimens, uh, that you can use to make these identifications. I can't overstress the importance of these curated collections. Uh, in Illinois, these collections represent almost 150 years of scientific research, and they're held in major repositories like the Illinois State Museum and the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. Scientists are continually returning to these collections to make new findings that really have changed our view of what's happened in the past. This has been a production of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey.